Hi, and welcome to Between Friends. I'm so glad that you have joined me today because we're going to be talking about tricks for continuous embroidery, tips for costume embroidery, and then some, you know, secrets to quick and easy embellishments to maybe save some time. And I know many of you maybe were here uh, several weeks ago when I had Gloria Cardosa here with me talking all about software and computer you know, organizing your files and so forth. Well, today she's back with, well, a topic that's pretty dear to her heart, and you're going to see why in a little while. So let's go ahead and welcome in Gloria Cardosa. Hi, Gloria. Hi, Eileen. It's I'm, just great to have you back. It is. I am so excited to be here and talk with you guys about one of my favorite subjects, like Eileen said, costume. It's something that I've held near and dear to my heart for as long as I can remember. That's awesome. Now you really have been making costumes. Do you wear them on yes. occasion? And yes. when do you wear them? Tell us when. Oh God, any reason I can find really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, there's uh, Renaissance fairs that are local here to the DFW area. There's anime conventions. We have one, a couple of the best ones in the US just right here in Dallas. Um, there's even a, like a fantasy ball that's coming up pretty soon that I'm super excited about the idea of not sure if I'll get to that one yeah. though. <laughs> so, you know, this costume making community, it's, it's not new, right? I mean, it's been around for quite a while now, but it kind of has two things in common. I was trying to wrap my head around it because I, and then I, I settled on the sports, right? Like major league baseball or the NFL, when you go to one of those games, everybody's wearing the same garb, right? You have your, you know, your chiefs on. Uh, one of our friends is just tuned in from Kansas City and she's got the big game tonight. So she's probably wearing red, gold, and white. And here in Dallas, of course, it's uh, blue and silver and white. So, you know, and the reason people do that is they want to go into that stadium and feel like they're part of the team, part of the community, and express their fandom, right? Their right. love of the team. So kind of the same in, in, the, in the costume community. It is. Like, I feel like any event that I've actually gone to and I've actually participated in, I've just enjoyed the event that much more. I felt more part of it. And I could, you know... I spent some time, you know, beforehand getting into cosplay, into the costume, into the event, and I just really got to appreciate my time there. Yeah, that's awesome. And and one of the really cool things about uh, costume making and, and wearing them is they're all one of a kind. So you really are kind of boasting your sewing skills, right? Often many of us make our own clothes or we embroider our own things. And unless you did a bad job, people don't really know that you did it, right? right. But in costumes, everybody, it, they're all individual garments. So it's they're all custom made. It's all custom yeah. to just mm -hmm. anything kind of pops into your head. There are no yeah. rules in costumes. You know, sometimes right. there's limitations in apparel, like everyday wear, yeah. that you're just not going to see in costumes, which just makes it that much more magical. It's awesome. It, so, you know, we have a lot to share here. But first, let's say hello to some of our friends. Here we have Donna over in Somerset, England. She says, good evening. Lovely to have you here, Donna. Thanks for joining us. And Terry Shopaholic, she says, thanks, Gloria, for helping her organize her files. So that's awesome. Right? I'm so excited that I was able to yeah. help you with that. Yeah, that's great. And sewing ski up in Ohio, Ohio, <laughs> dot that I, right? And Susan um, in uh, Connecticut. And there's Jan. Um, Mayu maybe is from Florida. She loves my shirt. Is the bath design a dime one? It sure is. It's in our cut and stitch software. And truth be told, Gloria and I created, really Gloria did a lot of the heavy lifting on this about 30 minutes ago. She decorated this black shirt. So, But honestly, with cut and stitch software, I mean, yeah. I'm not trying to like boast too much, but 
it made it that easy to do it in 30 minutes. I know. It's awesome. It's so much fun. So, you know, I had to get in on the, on the holiday spirit here, right? Chris up in Minnesota, welcome. It's good to have you here in Sandra Martin in, in uh, North Carolina and Deb in Delaware. So really lovely to have all of you here. And Deborah Morgan, cute t-shirt. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it's fun to wear. And I'm glad we did it early in the year because now we can do it. Um, now I can wear it all month, right? Okay, so here's Reen Wilcox, and we got to say hi to Reen. Hi, Reen. Yeah, Reen, of course, is the founder of Embroidery Garden. Many of you know her, so um, say hello to Reen. And Angela Green wants to know what is Cut and Stitch? Well, Cut and Stitch is a software program from Dime that uh, it allows you to incorporate embroidery, rhinestones, and HTV. So if you're not familiar with HTV, that's heat transfer vinyl. It really is a great product yeah. for like quick add-on right. embellishment. Yeah, we're going to show a little bit of that later today, but we're not going to show the software. That's a, a, another program, but uh, jump on over to our website. At, uh, speaking of our website, you can you can watch this event, this broadcast right on our website. So why don't we go ahead and bring in PowerPoint so we can show them that slide uh, of where they do that. Okay, so let's go ahead and maybe advance that. So, yeah, on this slide here, this shows you that you can actually watch this program right on our website, DZGNS, right on the um, home page. And everything that we're talking about today is available, you know, in the shopping cart below. And, you know, it's still Monster Hoop, Monster Mash month here, the whole month of October. So all hoops are on sale. That's both Snap Hoop Monster and Sticky Hoop. So, and... This week's special is the Tabletop Weightless Quilter. Now, you might wonder why we're talking about costumes when the Tabletop Weightless Quilter is the key pr product that we're promoting this week. Well, a lot of costumes can be really heavy, right, Gloria? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and they can also be delicate colors or fabrics that we want to keep up off the floor and out of harm's way. So that's where the Tabletop Weightless Quilter comes in handy. And you're going to see that in action in a little while. So go ahead, Gloria, why don't you take it away? Awesome. Let's get started, guys. So let's go. Let's get started with some of the things that I have made. And just to kind of get you inspired and go through some of the tips that I would kind of recommend in costume making with your embroidery machine. So this is a costume that I actually made for my niece several years ago. It's what I call costume in no time. Uh, they literally gave me this product to do about three days, Eileen, before they needed it done. And oh. I... I hate those short deadlines. Short deadlines, indeed. So here's a couple tips that I did to make this three-day project achievable. For one, I chose a simple sewing pattern, something with the least amount of pieces. I believe this jacket was five, a couple front pieces, a back, and your sleeves. That was the whole jacket. And that's really the key here, keeping it simple in that sewing pattern. Um, also minimal shaping. So there wasn't a lot of darts or extra sewing that needed to be done. It was literally just the seams to assemble your jacket. Uh, I kicked out the lining. No, if we have three days to make this, we are not putting in a lining. I don't know about you, Eileen. Oh, definitely not. Yeah, definitely uh, not. Uh, the way I decided to finish this garment, because you don't want to have all those ugly raw edges uh, and we don't have a lining anymore, is I used my facings. Uh, and if you don't know what facings are, they're just like, the pieces you kind of put on the edge of your garment to make them finished. And I flipped them to where they were decorative and they showed on the outside of the garment. And that's what you see that really beautiful brocade in. Right. So instead of putting the facing right sides together, you put it wrong sides together and then flip it to the outside of the garment, the right side of the garment. And boom, there you have a beautiful trim, right? Indeed. That's exactly what I did here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and then, uh, for the moon and the stars that you yeah. see there, that's again where that HTV, that heat transfer vinyl came into play. Right. Very easy to cut out, fuse into place, and move yeah. on. Yeah, and that's a children's costume, you know, so they're going to outgrow it for sure. Hopefully you pass it down to another family member. I think we've got a total of one use out yeah. of that. <laughs> okay, so let's see what else you have. Uh, we also have... Um, Okay, so costume for young children. So here's my thing about young children. They're usually the most picky to please. And even if you do please them by what it looks like, they don't want to wear it for long. <laughs> so one thing to do by keeping it simple is just make one great thing that they can be really excited about, not 20, because they're going to get really tired of wearing all those little pieces really right. quickly. So the top one right there is a cute little stitch hat. 
and it's soft it's fleece and on the inside i think i even lined it in flannel just oh. again to keep it soft against the kid's head that's lovely uh, and then tell us about wonder woman here so wonder woman was again a decent costume on its own but right. purchased correct? but purchased yeah mm -hmm. um but again the kid's not that excited about it like okay thanks mom for this costume that you grabbed off the rack at walmart and so to really kind of add to that make it feel a little bit more special is we made these little leather boot covers oh that's so cute and so yeah, yeah. So instead of the chuck converse you know here you have custom boots but they're just covers right no sole they're just going to go over the child's foot correct? exactly these are boot covers again keep it comfortable or else they're not going to be wearing it for very long and just a, another tip right here if you look back at that stitch hat we actually did or I actually did the uh, decoration of those little the little eye pieces on the flat side panel before I even assembled the hat. Mm -hmm. Put your little eye pieces on the flat uh, fabric, then cut your hat out and sew it up. Awesome. Okay. So let's see what else we got here. Mm -hmm. um, here's a couple pieces that I actually made for an anime convention that you know I frequent here in Dallas. Uh, the one on the left is inspired by if you've never heard of it lolita it's kind of like oh what are the, what are the words that i gave you Eileen? well remember? it's a cross between uh ursula and the and the little mermaid right and right. Who that else? was the character inspiration but the mm -hmm. style of garment that i'm wearing it's lolita it's victorian it's doll like and mm -hmm. that's kind of what that whole look is it's really ursula cute. from the little mermaid yeah. which we all kind of know and then that style of garment yeah um, and that's my niece. She kind of had her little uh, Harry Potter robe and her wand. The One Piece hat, that is an anime show. Uh, a friend of mine really loves that show. He wasn't really into wearing elaborate costumes, but he did want to show his pride and his enthusiasm for uh, that show. And so I made him this wonderful uh, metallic embroidered beanie. Okay. So here's something to kind of highlight that you don't need a lot of embroidery to jazz up a costume. Mm -hmm. This is a very large, almost bland red cape. And without that large embroidery on either side of the cape, it again, it's there's nothing it could, to it. It could be Little Red Riding Hood, right? It could be anything. Yeah, but now this embroidery is applied after the garment is created. As we could see, you know, the embroidery sits right on top of a seam. So here's a great use for, or, you know, the, a call for using the tabletop weightless quilter to keep that, the whole bottom hem of that cape up off the floor of your sewing room, right? <laughs> exactly. Otherwise, like many of our larger products, you know, it's just falling off the table, pulling yeah. away from the machine. That tabletop yeah. weightless quilter really kind of holds right. it away. It's cute. It's really great. And so, here's Gloria. I love this. You're at the Ren Fair here, right? Renaissance Fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's a couple of them, actually. And uh, you can kind of tell that this is one of my favorite places to go in the, you know, in my year. Um, again, this is m one of my examples of keeping it simple because in each of these garments, I think I only fully made one piece. Uh, mm -hmm. On the left and right, I just made the corsets. And the other pieces I sourced. You don't have to make every single costume completely from head to toe from scratch for it to be special. Right. So the white uh, blouse, very generic, just something is a staple in my wardrobe that I keep for my costumes. Yeah. The skirt uh, on the left is something I thrifted. And I did some minor alterations just to make it that much better. Yeah, that's great. And so when you're thrifting, you know, goodness. Well, first off, it's a cool thing to recycle, right? And reuse. But it's very inexpensive normally, the garments that you buy at a thrift store, right? Exactly. Yeah. And it does kind of hurt me a little bit because I am I am kind of a frugal nut. And yes. I hate spending like $70 for a costume that's yeah. not even going to look as good as what you're seeing here. Absolutely. So let's see. Let's get started on like where you would get started when you're starting your embroidery process, when you're starting your conceptualizing. Um, when I'm starting, I like to know where I'm going because that's really where most of my costumes, they kind of bloom from. And you can see a couple, you have the anime convention on the left, you have the Renaissance Fair on the bottom. Those are some of the places that I, that's where the ideas start for me. Uh, if I see something on Pinterest or Instagram, those are some of my other favorite places to find inspirational images. Mm -hmm. And even stories. Honestly, Eileen, I'm also a reader. I don't know where I find the time to do any of my hobbies because <laughs> I read like five to seven books a month at this point. 
That's awesome. Reading is great. I love to read also. And, uh, but sketching, you are yes. also very talented at sketching. So look at this sketch. Now you're going to see this up, close up in a moment. Here you go. Wow. I love this. This is talk about, you know, the evolution of an idea, right? You just kind of start with uh, it, the inspiration, whether that's Pinterest or the event that where you're going, a character in a book. And then you take pen to a pencil to paper and you just kind of start drawing it out what you would see this character wearing. Exactly. And you don't have to be a great artist to get your ideas out on paper, guys. You just have to be able to get your pencil on a paper. Right. You know, sometimes this process starts with lists. And mm -hmm. if I couldn't draw, yeah. I imagine it would be a lot of collaging. Sure. Sure. Cutting, you know, images out of uh, magazines or, you know, what have you. Now, some of these elements you already own. So I, I'm really impressed with how you often, in, you know, you look at what you already have and see what you need to make to really bring this all to life, right? Right. Because again, I don't like, you know, it's not a great place to, how do I say this, Eileen? Well, uh, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to take 50 hours of sewing, you know, for a costume, right? Right. You don't want to overwhelm yourself. You know, focus your energy on something one big beautiful piece right and so these are all again garments thank you eileen yeah. that i do own and that inspired me again to build into my costume and make that that much easier because yeah. now all i have to worry about is my statement piece sure and then it also helps you got you know guide you with color selection right right and i will be honest color selection is one of my hardest oh, things to tackle all, yeah we all struggle with color you know selecting color whether it's thread or fabric what have you and sometimes what we have in our mind we can't find so that's a challenge so let's see what we have here okay so if we already kind of rushed over this uh brushed over this a, a little bit Eileen mm -hmm. it's quick and easy embellishments and a couple of my favorites again HTV I will say it I'll repeat it because it's so easy and it's so, so little for so much. Right. A lot of impact. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh, let me add. There you go. I forgot yeah. to give that to you guys. You can see a little bit here of the HTV that we added to our product and it just makes it shine so right. much. So it's an applique design that, uh, at, that Gloria created in cut and stitch software. Now, you know, yeah, if you did the whole thing in HTV, it would be super fast, but the luxurious look mm -hmm. of embroidery and HTV just elevates that garment to a whole nother level, right, Gloria? Exactly. I really, really like mixing medias because once you start mixing those different things together, it just adds layers yeah. to your project. And, and that's yeah. what you see here. And really catches the eye, you know, as you wear it. It's it's very flattering. So uh, I love what you've done here. It's really pretty. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Another thing you can do is actually add rhinestone. And you can actually see this exact design yeah, on Eileen's shirt right, right now. Right. Yeah, um, absolutely. Again, a very quick thing to add to your products to just add another layer of depth to your project. Yeah. Now that HTV that you used uh, on your garment is the Aurora, right? Right. And my purple bats are the Caesar glitter. So yeah, we love both. Yes. Hard to choose between the two. Uh -huh. Which is why we kind of didn't. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Both flavor. All right. So let's get back to it, right? To the meat of it, costume embroidery tips. So when you've gotten past that concept stage, you've written down some of your notes, you've pulled some pictures, you made your sketch, whatever that process was, now you have to actually start figuring out how you're gonna build this piece. And when I start that part, I like to think about my patterns, my sewing patterns, because mm -hmm. not everyone can make sewing patterns. So you're probably gonna find something from like the big pattern companies to use as your base to start with. Um, so the big key there is to make sure that whatever patterns that you're choosing have space to allow you to embroider on. And we'll kind of go over that a little bit more later. Uh, you also want to be mindful of your fabric choice. And this is something Eileen had to kind of reinforce in me because I she knows me. I'll, I'll go straight for the pretty fabrics and not really think if that's the best option. All right. <laughs> but it's the way I like to think about that one is if you think you need to add a little bit more thought process to it, if you're going to sew that fabric, like if it's a finicky fabric to work with, it might be a smidge finicky to embroider on. So it just, it's not that you can't do it. It just requires more effort. Right. 
And then uh, also thinking about your thread colors. Here's a couple different thread. How do I say that? Options, really. really. Yeah. So, you know, the gray on the left is, you know, close up. It, what you've been seeing here is visible, but you know, you move six feet away and that gray is just getting lost into that darker fabric. So, you know, always think about making sure that it's going to be pleasing to the eye, but also visible. So often we, we tend to choose colors that are too close to the base fabric and then the embroidery really isn't visible. So break out of your comfort zone, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that was with the gray. The gray is very, you know, scary. It's muted. Mm -hmm. It does very much fall into the fabric. The other three you very much can see, but are they the right look? Yeah. You know, for what you're going for. And you'll see what we went for at the end. <laughs> so we're, now we need to take our measurements because everybody is different. It's not... You need to take your measurements so you know what pattern to use and how big to make things and how much room for embroidery you have. I like to start with something like this, which is an embroidery, which is a measurement taking sheet. It's just a place for you to keep your measurements. I like to date them because I don't know if you're like me, but I fluctuate in weight. So I like to know which version of my <laughs> measurement sheet I'm on. That's right. Uh, and then again, choose your sewing pattern. So I told you guys that we're going to talk a little bit about good and bad patterns. This one's going to be in the no pile for me for embroidery ready sewing patterns. It's absolutely covered in ruffles and yeah. gathers and pleats. It already has its, has its embellishments. It doesn't need any more. It does not need any more. And if you did yeah. add it, where would you put it? Because you wouldn't see it. Yeah. And right. what was the point of all that work? Something like this is much more appropriate because then you look at that. You have great large spaces yeah. to work with to really mm -hmm. put your embroidery anywhere it goes, anywhere you can. Right. And it would shine. Yes, absolutely. Front and center. So we're going to create, now we're going to create our embroidery layout. We're going to, so here's a sketch from uh, the sketchbook. And it kind of gave us an idea of where we we're going to go with this. Mm -hmm. Don't live in that. Don't don't say that's your only way of going. This is my inspiration, and this is where I started with my embroidery when I started to create it and put things together. Mm -hmm. It was a guide. It was an idea, and it was a great place to start. Uh, once we get to the actual embroidery machine, though, these this design was way long. Yeah. It was like 30 inches, which I don't have a hoop that big. Right. So let's take a look at how you would uh, break apart a large design in our perfect embroidery pro so let's go ahead and put that up there and i'm going to play this video and kind of talk through it so in a uh, perfect embroidery pro you select your whole design and you know what i'm just going to back that up because i don't think we saw the very beginning so let's start that again so here's the, our design which is about 30 inches so we're going to select that whole design and once it's selected, we'll then click on the split design icon. And then we get this window that comes up. I'm going to select my hoop size. So the software knows uh, what size to break down this large design into. And then I hit split preview. And when I do that, I can see each of the three hoopings, right? And so, you know, I, I can make some adjustments by clicking on split preview again. And then that allows me to move the design, the individual elements, so I can, you know, adjust it how I want. You can most certainly can just go with the default of the software or make your own adjustments. It gives you the freedom to do that. Now, remember, this is Imperfect Embroidery Pro. And then you hit save and give it a name and you save it uh, under a name that you're going to remember. And then we're going to open up each individual one. And I'm just going to show you that first design so I can explain. So it's grouped when you come in. So select the design and then right click and click on ungroup. And now we're going to remove these outer placement marks, just that one down in the corner, because we want the freedom 
to uh, change this, these placement marks to accommodate our hoop. So I'm just making that placement mark a little bit more narrow down to 6.30, which is the same size of the, of the design. And that gives me freedom in my hoop. And I'm going to do that for all three of the designs. And once that's complete, I'll save the design in the machine format that I'm going to stitch. And I send it over to my machine. And once it's over to the machine, then it's just time to stitch. So I've added a crosshair because it's always great to do that. And then I'm gonna print a template. So here in print preview, you can see exactly the design with the crosshair and that's it. So I, next up, we are um, going to talk about really making this happen. Now we have our designs all created. Now, Gloria, I love this. This image here shows the five panels that you're going to stitch on one width of fabric, selvage to selvage, so that you could fit all of those panels on one piece of fabric and not have to waste fabric because of all that excess fabric we often need for hooping. So, you have traced the first pattern piece as close to the edge as you can, allowing space for hooping, right? Like the one on the left, That's correct? That's right. I even put my template down on my fabric and even put my hoop there at one point just to kind of gauge it yes. to make sure that I had enough room for my piece, for my hoop and everything. And that's just something I just did for the first hooping. Yeah. Right. And, you know, you can apply this. It doesn't have to be for costume making, but any kind of embroidery that you're doing on patterned sections, right? Instead of cutting out the section and trying to figure out how you're going to stitch so close to the seam line or the edge of the fabric, well, just trace those pattern pieces first, and then you can work on a large expanse of fabric. Right. I mean, if we didn't go about it in this method, each strip of fabric to yeah. do each panel, it would have had to have been like 14, 16 inches wide. Right, right. And at that width, you're only getting like three strips yeah across the fabric right that's a it. lot of waste it's a, a lot ton of waste. of waste yeah so this allowed me to use maybe a yard of fabric to do all the decorative work on my that. costume that's awesome so let's go ahead and take a look because she really did stitches stitch this this, this isn't just all virtual <laughs> embroidery so let's take a look at the overhead So here it is, guys. This is one completed panel of the entirety mm -hmm. of our costume piece here. And you can even see a little bit of that HTV there. Oh, Isn't that, that Aurora? Isn't it awesome? It's so pretty. I yeah, love this it's stuff. Luminescent. It's really cool. So where are we getting started today, Eileen? Well, you know, it well, we already stitched. Let's show your fab your fabric uh of the next panel that you're going to stitch. Now, of course, she's already done all these panels. So we just prepared this one piece for you. And you've stitched the first design. Correct. And, and you've printed the template of the second design. Now you could just hoop that and finagle uh at the machine, centering the needle over the crosshair, but we're going to switch to sticky hoop and our perfect alignment laser. And where do you see how sweet this process is? So we have on the machine, we have selected, uh, we've stitched the first color of the second design. And that's that stitch line. So let's go ahead and just move that out of PAL so they can see that's there actually you. a stitched line right on the fabric. And then... You're going to align PAL with the zero on the uh, oh, centering ruler and the horizontal line of PAL with the stitched mark, right? There so, we go. Yeah, and you're on a hoop mat, so we know that hoop's not moving. Everything's nice and firm uh, under PAL. And then you're going to take that fabric piece that already has design one on it, and you're just going to take your time to position the um, crosshair. Yeah. Well, the placement. Well, the placement mark and the long vertical line on the crosshair with PAL. I love this. Look I know. It. It's so cool. And then if you peel back that template, go ahead and, yeah, to the, exactly what you're doing. So she's finger pressing the fabric to the sticky stabilizer underneath. But if you peel it from this area first, we can get a good look and make sure that we are aligned with that stitch line and, you know, that we like how it's all going to align. So I think we are happy, right? Perfect. I think we are set to go to the machine. Yeah. Awesome. 
Okay, so now you're going to take that uh, the board that comes with sticky hoops and you could transport you it were, over to the machine. You are so right, Eileen. Yeah. Because, you know, this is often, you know, it's always in the setup of embroidery, right? It's the hooping, the placement, all of that, where we sometimes struggle. And if we take the most care at that time during the embroidery process and then transport the hoop to the machine in a safe fashion, you know, you have a lot more confidence that everything's going to stitch out exactly as you'd plan. So that's why we always say um, to use that board. So let's take a look at what Reen Wilcoxon has said. She says, I knew you were talented, Gloria, but wow, I didn't know you were such an amazing sewist and crafter. I agree. Lots of hidden talent in, in lots of people, right? But definitely in Gloria. And creative applicate, applique says, OMG, amazing. Yeah, they really liked your stitched out, your stitch out for sure. It's well, thank so you impressive. Guys. Yeah. So let's go ahead and take a look at the a machine. She's getting it onto the machine, but she's also going to be placing that excess fabric in the weightless quilter so that, you know, it, right now this is just the one panel, but as this gets heavier, you most certainly want to manage the weight of that fabric so that um, it doesn't drag out of the hoop, doesn't pull the, you know, the embroidered section or the part that you're working on out of the hoop. So we are, uh, she's ready to stitch. Now, the first thing she's gonna have to do is make sure she takes time to remove that. Um, and so um, let's see how that goes. Takes a little bit of doing for sure. And you have to hold the fabric um, down, but I think she's, she got it down. So let's see, let's go ahead and add her back in. There we go. All righty, and just lower that presser foot. Now remember, we're at color number two because she's already stitched the first color. And uh, it's just gonna take off right there and start stitching that braid. And eventually it'll connect with the first design. One of the things that I don't like about when you're doing continuous embroidery is sometimes the second design, uh, the first stitches are not at the connection point. Right. And so, you know, you kind of like, you know, you hope, you pray, you keep your fingers crossed. I mean, I'm confident we use all these tools. You know, we know it's going to work out, but it just would be a lot more comfortable if it you showed us that first stitch. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's pretty cool. So, Gloria, what do we do after we do all that embroidery? It takes a while. Right. Right. We're going to do this panel, but go ahead and show us what's next. Can we get a PowerPoint? There we go. So after you've you know embroidered all your panels, now it's time to sew it up and show it off. So here is the finished piece, guys. Yeah. And sewing it up, I'm not I'm not gonna explain that to you guys just because it's gonna be such a different process for everyone. But this is my baby right here, Eileen. Right. <laughs> I know. You poured your heart and soul into that. And you know what's really cool about this? You know, it's grommeted together, all those panels. So this is something that, as you mentioned earlier, your weight fluctuates. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you can drop one or pull it tighter or loosen it up. It doesn't really matter. But also because there's so many panels, you know, you could probably incorporate this to another costume where you're maybe just using one as a like a big peplum or something, right? Oh, for sure. You know, yeah. I could add grommets to just like a belt type of piece yeah. or a back kind of peplum wrap and it right. becomes a whole new yeah. garment. Absolutely. So Pamela Mitchell says, great idea, a great idea of a use for the weightless quilter. So absolutely, you know, the weightless quilter is really for more than just quilting, believe it or not. It's very handy in home deck. Uh, if you're doing curtains, um, balances that have a lot of weight, that kind of thing. And it's also good because it works in small spaces. So a lot of us want to do big projects, but we work in a small space. And, you know, what do you do with all this bundle of fabric? So the weightless quilter keeps it up out of harm's way. It's awesome, right? Uh, it's really, honestly, one of my favorites. It clamps right onto my main sewing and work table, and I use it for everything. Yeah, it's cool. Really, really cool. So showing it off. When are you going to wear this? Uh, actually, I will be officially wearing it the first weekend in November. I'll be down in, at the Texas Renaissance Fair. So if there's anyone in the Houston area who's going to that, yeah. look, look out for me. Say hi if you yeah. see me. That's right, because you know what she's wearing. And, you know, she's also going to be, and so am I, 
at Quilt Fest in Houston uh, on November 1st, 2nd, and 3rd mm -hmm. at, in All Brands booth. We're both going to be there. And uh, maybe we can talk Gloria into wearing her costume. You know, a lot of people go to <laughs> costumes well they do because it's halloween week so i forgot about that yeah you never know so maybe we'll get her to wear it uh-huh only if you're really nice to me i'll consider it okay i'll try to be really nice yeah uh -huh. okay so reen says woohoo see you there because reen is also going to be in the all brands booth uh you'll have to check their schedule to see when she's teaching but um yeah we can't wait to see reen down there so Shug says, can you do a king size quilt with the tabletop weightless quilter? No, the tabletop weightless quilter has a limit of size, really, and weight of like 54 by 54 inches, right? A 54 inch square or, or a quilt sandwich is really um, what you would handle in the tabletop weightless quilter. Now we have the, the original weightless quilter, which is a floor stand, and that can handle king size quilts for sure. So... Um, I hope that you'll, uh, you know, if you're doing big stuff, you probably need it. <laughs> Let's see. You know, one of our uh, educators, Eileen, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, she actually sometimes uses a combination of methods, depending on which workspace you're in. Uh -huh. Some of her spaces are oh. tighter than others. Yeah. And so she will use sure. on one corner the tabletop yeah. and then the main weightless folder in the other. Yeah. I think we have a slide on some other uses that people do. Yeah. So let's see. Um, yeah, well, it is a great set of helping hands, right? For mm -hmm. sure. Holding large garments in small spaces. You know, we use it for a lot of things. Well, here, it, we use it to hold cameras. Actually, the camera that <laughs> Gloria's face is being broadcast on is being held by the weightless quilter tabletop. And let's see, Wendy, uh, Wenda wants to know what's the largest quilt. Oh, I want that come up. There we go. What is the largest quilt this can handle? So the tabletop weightless quilter mm -hmm. can handle about a 54 inch square quilt sandwich. When you get beyond that, we really do recommend that you go to a uh, to the weightless quilter, the original weightless quilter, which is a floor model, and that can handle king size quilts for sure. So. Um, Rita Ranke, she says she sure wishes she was going to Houston again this year. I had the opportunity of meeting Rita last year at Quilt Fest, and that was super fun. So, uh, well, Rita, maybe next year, right? There's always next year. And let's see, how does the weightless quilter at the tabletop attach to the back? It's on a table, but it is attached to a wall. It is her machine. So the weightless quilter has a clamp that opens up to one and a half inches wide, I believe. Something about that. If, yeah. If that's not right, it is on the be, site. Yeah. Uh, it's on our site for sure, all those details. But uh, that is, so it's a table clamp. And there you get two of the goosenecks and two of the fabric clamps and two of the clamps that fit on the table. So that's what the weightless quilter consists of. It's, you know, the two part the two whole pieces. And sometimes you will use one, sometimes you'll use two. And depending on where you are, you know, you may want to get, you know, a second one and a second yeah. set and use more than that. So, and it's on special this week, right, Gloria? Yeah, so it it's is. $59.99, free shipping on orders over $75. So we hope that you take advantage of that. Um, we do love our weightless quilters here. I'll tell you, it, we use... We always have, I, I always have a weightless quilter up. I have the tabletop on my machine at home, surround, you know, clamp to that table. And then I leave the floor model around my machine. I take the poles out uh, when I'm not actually quilting a quilt, but I leave that floor frame in place because it's so easy to, you know, it just slides underneath the table. So what else is up next? Let's see. Oh, like I said, you can watch and shop right on our page. So if you're not a Facebook person or you don't want to watch on YouTube, well, you can watch right on our homepage. So we'd love for you to join us there. And what's coming up next? Well, before you know it, it's going to be time for another Between Friends or another Software Success. And on uh, October 17th is part four of The Powerful One. Now, what's The Powerful One? Well, that is Perfect Embroidery Pro, our full digitizing software program. And you can catch Ashley here at uh, Facebook or YouTube before, you know, and uh, her lessons are phenomenal. I know many of you watch and give us great comments about what learning from Ashley. She's our software wizard. So if you're wondering, 
how you can be notified. This is how you can be notified when we're going live. In this video, we'll show you how to subscribe to a YouTube channel and follow a Facebook page through your phone. Let's start with YouTube. First, open your YouTube app on your phone. Once you're on your home page, search for the designs in machine embroidery in the search bar at the top of the screen. Click on it and go to the channel page. Once on the channel page, click the subscribe button. And that's it. You're now subscribed to the channel. Now let's move on to Facebook. First, open your Facebook app. Once on your home page, search for designs and machine embroidery in the search bar at the top of the screen. Once on the profile page, click the three dots and select the follow button. And that's it. You're now following the page. Thanks for watching. Well, you know, Jennifer Alexander says Ashley's programs are awesome, and we most certainly agree. So thanks for that shout out to Ashley. And Susan says, getting here late. That's okay, Susan. You could always re-watch the uh, broadcast so that you uh, don't miss a thing. And everyone was checking in with you due to your tornado last night. I hope you're okay. And I'm not sure where you are, but I hope that you were safe. Okay, so up next week, uh, I'll be back with Ayn McCarthy. Now, I don't know if many of you know Ayn McCarthy, but Ayn is a dime educator and she is so talented. She's going to join me next Thursday at one o'clock and we're going to be doing stitching, holiday stitching and not just Halloween, also Christmas. So she's super talented and lots of fun. So I hope you'll join us next week, the 19th. So I know on the house, now's yeah, the time to, re to reveal the on the house. But first off, we'd like to see what you've been stitching. We love seeing them. Aren't they great? Those are so cute. They are all so cute. So this week is um, Happy Hello Thanksmas. So there's a gnome for everyone. <laughs> Isn't that so cute? You know what I really love about this, Eileen, is that it is a uh, multi-month, multi-holiday embroidery that can just leave up for like three months. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. You know, well, you who is not afraid to invest time in sewing. But in this, this would be one decoration. So let's see. Cindy Ball says that Ain is new to me, she says. Well, you are in for a treat. I'll tell you, please join me next week. You're going to love meeting Ain. She's awesome. So Rita Ranke says, oh, my goodness, love, love. Terry Shopaholic, she loves it. So much fun. And, you know, they really are those gnomes. Aren't they cute? We have the purple and black striped hat and then the, uh, you know, the pumpkin in his hand and then our Christmas gnome on this on the other side. So it's really fun. And um so it's so nice to see everybody says, uh, you know, that they love to watch the Dime Educators, Pamela Mitchell says. Each of them has their own spin and you always find something new and of interest. Absolutely. We learn from each other all the time. And it's amazing to me how you can have, you know, one product and people use it in a myriad ways. So many different ways. It's just super fun. We're always learning. So, um, this week we have a uh, waitlist quarter still on special and of course it's monster hoop all week long and i mean all month long so that's both sticky hoops and the snap hoop monster so i hope that you'll take advantage of that and uh i hope that you'll join me here next week so thank you for joining us today and gloria thank you for all your hard work and sharing your creativity with us you're welcome it's always a joy to hang out with you and our dime customers Absolutely. Bye for now. We'll see you next week. Bye.